What's going on guys, Kyle here, and today we're gonna be talking all about blogging for real estate. If you don't already know who I am, again, my name is Kyle Handy. I'm a real estate agent based out of San Antonio, Texas, but I also lead a team of agents across the country and even in Canada. Uh, and so if you're not already subscribed to my channel, definitely consider subscribing. Hit that like button below and leave a comment and let me know what you think about this video. But that being said, today we're gonna to be talking again about blogging for real estate. We're gonna talk all about creating unique, valuable, and optimized content to help you have a real estate blog that ranks on Google and generates leads for you and creates all sorts of good stuff in your business. So that being said, I'm gonna go ahead and talk about what we're gonna cover. We're gonna talk about why you should blog, how to write a good blog, and then also the technical aspects. So the keywords that are, are gonna help you get your blog post noticed on-page SEO, what does that even mean? Off-page SEO, what do you do to, to, to get that? And then of course, some real estate specific blog tips, and then just some other tips that would apply to any industry uh, if you're watching this channel or watching this video uh, and you may not be a, a real estate agent. So let's go ahead and just dive right in guys and talk about first off why you should blog. All right, so a little bit of background. So I've been blogging for about two years now and I've gotten so much business from my website, kylehandy.com. So, you know, doesn't matter really what niche that you're in, if you are a real estate agent or if you're not, blogging can certainly help your, your business. And even though we're in 2020, uh, and you know, some people think, oh my gosh, you know, did I miss the boat? Uh, you know, I needed to start my blog 10 years ago. That is so far from the truth. The things that I'm gonna share with you in today's video are going to tell you exactly kind of step-by-step -step how you can uh, get noticed and get traffic on your blog posts um, and actually, you know, do it the right way. Cause I mean, I know that a lot of people have probably tried blogging and uh, you know, weren't successful with it or they never got traffic to their post. And trust me, there's a lot of ways to be unsuccessful with blogging, just like there's a lot of ways to be unsuccessful with being a real estate agent. But if you follow these tips, you'll see that there is definitely a formula uh, that will get you proven results that are going to help you in your business. So first off, one of the great things that you should know about creating a blog is that it creates authority and experience. So that's one of the things that for me has set me apart is that, you know, yes, I like to also get organic traffic and get people that uh, come across my brand and my, my kind of business uh, organically, but at the same time, also for the people that already know me or maybe know me a little bit, when they also see that I've created all this content and you know I'm giving back, uh, it just really kind of solidifies me as the choice of the agent that they want to work with or the partner that uh, they want to join my team. And so that's kind of one of those things where you'll realize that by creating this blog, there are going to be a couple reasons uh, or a couple ways that it's going to help you in your business. So the other one is that you're going to gain greater knowledge. Uh, when you start blogging and you start writing about certain topics, uh, you by no means need to already be the expert on that topic. Most of the things that I do a YouTube video about or that I blog about, you know, I don't know everything before I actually think of what the topic is. Uh, but once I select that topic and I know that I either want to write about it or create a video on it, I then go out and I start doing all sorts of research to make sure that there is not something that I haven't forgot or, you know, that I didn't put into my post. And by doing that, it just makes me even uh, more educated about that topic. And then we all know, too, when you start to teach or train anything, uh, you start to get a deeper understanding of it. So certainly by blogging or, you know, by creating a YouTube video, you're going to be a better, more knowledgeable expert in all of the fields that you're choosing to, to, to create your content around. So also you're going to, again, create more leads. So this is, you know, the, the whole idea behind wanting to start a blog is ideally 
you're wanting to get discovered by somebody, right? Like you want somebody to come across your post. If you're a real estate agent and you're blogging about, you know, the different uh, ideas in your market or the different topics in your market, maybe it's, you know, zip codes and the pr price ranges in those zip codes, or maybe it's just about, you know, date night tips in, you know, your local market, the best places for people to go. You're trying to get noticed by the people that are doing those searches in hopes that at some point, maybe they come across your post, they need a real estate agent, and then they register, you're able to reach out and have already built a somewhat of a connection with them. They're kind of a warm audience because they've been consuming your content at some point in time. So that is a great way to capture warm leads, people that are already kind of uh, excited to speak with you versus completely cold leads uh, that may not want anything to do with you. So uh, creating a blog can, can definitely do that. And then lastly, it's gonna save you time in the long run, um, you know, up front, it might seem like it's a big investment. And trust me, it is uh, to create a blog that you're creating consistent, helpful content takes time. Uh, but in the long run, uh, when you have pieces of content that you can share with people when a certain situation comes up, uh, it's extremely valuable. So for instance, in my space, you know, I've got uh, real estate agents that, you know, maybe they want to start up a YouTube channel or maybe they want to create a blog. Well, instead of me having to now, you know, explain that concept out or explain the steps out uh, to multiple different people at different times, I just now send links because I've already created content for it. And it's the same way if, uh, if you're a real estate agent and in your real estate business, you're going to get those same questions or, you know, from the buyers or from sellers uh, about certain topics. And yes, you might be able to spend 15, 20 minutes and go into, you know, explaining the answer to those questions, but it's even uh, more professional in my opinion uh, and better when you can just share them a link that's been very well thought out. Uh, it's been organized and you can share that with people because then not only do they get to read it, but they might think, Hey, that's kind of cool. And then the next time their friend asks it, they might start sharing your content for you, uh, which is really, really powerful. So these are just a couple of the reasons why you definitely should consider starting a blog here in 2020. It's definitely not too late. And what we're going to start kind of talking about next are some of the ways that now that you've decided to create the blog, how you're going to actually be effective with creating these posts and getting them to be seen by other people. The first thing starts with creating good blog posts. How do you write a good blog post? Uh, you know, writing a blog post might be a little different than, you know, what you might have thought of writing an article or a paper that you had to do back in high school or in college. Uh, blog posts are certainly a little bit different. Um, and in my opinion, I actually enjoy creating blog posts more. I was never a writer in high school, uh, college. I actually, I was more of a math person myself, but here blogging, it's kind of, you know, you get to share your personality. Things don't have to be super technical, uh, as far as writing goes. In fact, you'll see one of the uh, points there is that you want to keep a conversational tone. You want to keep things, um, easy to read, right? So again, it's not like this super long essay that is very difficult to read. You want it to be an easy read for people. So first off, niche down. Uh, again, if you're a real estate agent, that kind of just means, hey, work on your market, um, you know, create content that is relevant to your area. And so, I'll, and when I get into kind of the more keyword specific things, you'll see what I mean by this. But if you're not a real estate agent and you're watching this, figure out what your niche is. Don't be so broad or so general um, that, you know, it's going to be hard for somebody like yourself just starting out uh, to get ranked uh, amongst all of the big competitors. The more that you niche down and you get specific, uh, it's easier to start ranking for those uh, smaller terms, those smaller niches. Uh, so you'll see what I'm talking about again later on once we talk, talk a little bit more about keywords and what to look for there. But then when we're actually creating the blog posts, keep them easy to read short paragraphs. So, you know, most of my paragraphs in my blog posts are only one, two or three sentences long. I don't have, you know, long blocks of text that people have to read through. Um, you want to break up long sentences. So if you see and or, you know, uh, between or but or anything like that. However, you know, make sure they're separate sentences. Don't just have really long run on sentences. Uh, break them up into uh, multiple smaller sentences so they're easier to read. Uh, use multimedia in your posts. So that could be video. That could be just images. But don't just have it just be a long block of texts. Try and break it up. Even if you have to use some stock imagery or things like that. We'll talk about that here in a little bit. 
And then of course, keep it a conversational tone. Uh, and then, all right, so now that you kind of know as far as the body of your text and, and kind of a, a baseline there, and at least just the, the framework, the other important thing is your headline. Headlines are so important uh, with getting your click-through rate uh, to be increased. And a click-through rate is basically like if somebody searches Google, you know, and they see the first 10 results uh, on the, the Google uh, search engine page, you know, what's going to make somebody click yours versus the other nine on that page. And typically it all boils down to your headline. So, you know, you want to create click worthy headlines, not click bait. Okay. Because that will get people upset with you. Uh, you don't want to under deliver on some huge promise that you make and make this click worthy or click baity kind of headline just so that way people are clicking on because ultimately that will hurt. Uh, your rankings long term. Uh, but, you know, things like lists, you know, the 11 blog posts you need to create today, right? Like something like that. Uh, how to's, people like how to's, questions. So, like, if you know that your blog post is answering a question, put that question in the headline, right? Like, um, you know, how do I create a good headline? It, right, that would be your question and then put a little snot, uh, a little snippet at the end of that, you know, the nine ways to be effective or something, right? You know, after you've asked that question, that would be your complete title. Um, but you can do, of course, uh, really, really powerful ones can be case studies and you can put that in your title, you know, case study, how, you know, this real estate agent went from selling no homes to 40 homes in one year, right? Like that would be a click worthy headline. And as long as you deliver on that promise, um, then it's going to be effective, right? It's not clickbait if you actually deliver on what you said you were going to in your title. Uh, and then a good introduction. Uh, we all wish that everybody would read every single one of our blog posts word for word, but I'm going to be honest with you. It just doesn't happen. Nobody reads every single blog post word for word. And so you got to capture their attention though, at least from the start. And so typically I take a formula where I like my blog posts in the introduction to have three sentences. The first sentence introduces what the problem is, right? Like why they came to your blog post to start because you want to create kind of that um, just you're on the same level with them. Like y'all are, you know, speaking the same language, so to speak. And then you want to discuss your solution in one sentence, right? And then you want to give the proof of whatever that uh, solution did for the person, right? So all three of those you want to be in your introduction, and then you're going to expand on all of those points in your blog post. So again, make that introduction really powerful because that's usually what's going to either keep the person reading on your post or just click back uh, and go to something else. You also want to, again, include statistics and case studies when possible uh, in your blog posts. The reason why is, of course, you know, they're powerful. They get a lot of people's attention. But then another more important thing, and we're going to talk about this later when we get into the SEO side of things, search engine optimization, but they're going to create backlinks for your blog. A backlink is basically when somebody says, hey, I like Kyle's blog. You know, this post actually helps me explain what I want to explain on my website or in my blog post. I'm going to link to his article because, so I don't have to recreate the wheel, right? I'm going to put what I think is important about my topic, but then if he says something that goes into more detail about a little synopsis, I'm going to link to his post. And when you have statistics or case studies that are unique that you've created uh, and you include them in your article, then at that point, you are going to get a backlink and that's going to tell Google that, hey, this article this person created is getting links from other websites. It must be a good uh, blog post. And so at that point, you're going to uh, increase your search engine results uh, page rankings and it's going to get you more traffic on your blog posts. Uh, so unique images and infographics, that's kind of the same as statistics and case studies. Very powerful. A lot of people like to link to those. Uh, on their own posts. Updating old posts. This is another good one is maybe you already have a blog and you've had it for a while, but the posts are older. You don't have to completely trash and start anew. And in fact, you may not want to because some of those blog posts may still be getting traffic. 
Uh, they may be already ranking for things, but maybe you just need to update the content and make it a little bit more uh, up to date as far as if it's you know 2020 and there's some new uh, aspects as far as how you can uh, be more efficient or better or however that blog post needs to change, go back and change that up versus just completely deleting or completely starting a different post that kind of competes with that topic, right? All right, and then as far as uh, text and uh, getting into like the length of a blog post, uh, I like to keep it to about 1500 words for a competitive keyword. And I'll show you what a competitive keyword here is just uh, in a little bit. And then if it's like an easy keyword, like a really kind of specific keyword that you're targeting and it's um, not something that a whole lot of people would go after, you may not need to write an entire 1500 word blog post. You could do probably a quick 500 one, uh, word blog post and have it be ranking for some of those easier keywords. And then lastly, once you have created that entire blog post, ask for feedback before you publish it. So if you've got a friend or if you've got, you know, a spouse or just anybody that can read through it and give you some, some feedback on it, it's super helpful. Uh, I know that I've found even just with my wife, she's not a real estate agent, but when I have her read my blog posts, she gives me a lot of great insight because she comes from the standpoint of like, Hey, I'm not experienced. What does this mean? You know, you didn't really explain it very well. You just kind of assumed that everybody knows this. And so a lot of times just getting that extra feedback before you go and publish can be the difference between getting a blog post that gets read and gets ranked versus one that maybe goes over somebody's head. And because of that, you think that it's the best blog post ever, but it's not going to rank because other people maybe just don't get it. Right. So again, uh, always ask for feedback and, uh, and, and use that, uh, to help make your articles and your posts better. All right. Now we're going to get into the technical aspects. So, Keywords matter. We all know words matter, but keywords definitely matter. Don't just create blog posts for the sake of creating blog posts. I made this mistake for probably the first couple years. So I say that I've been making a blog for about the last year and a half because that's when I actually got intentional about it. I've had a blog for quite some time, but you know, it was just one of those things where I wasn't consistent. I just kind of threw things on there like probably what, you know, most uh, people do when they first start out on a blog. Uh, I was just throwing random posts up there, kind of not really doing any kind of keyword research uh, up front. And realistically, keyword research is where it all should start. Like you shouldn't even spend any time on creating blog posts unless you've done the keyword research uh, up front. So 51% of all website traffic comes from organic search. And it's very specific. I mean, it's just algorithms that kind of rank different websites when people are searching for certain terms. And so if your post is not set up in the beginning uh, to be seen by Google as far as like how they want it to be uh, seen and how it should be uh, to, to get ranked, then you're just kind of spinning your wheels. So again, keyword research, it very much matters. And I'm going to kind of tell you guys how to do keyword research. So it starts on Google, right? Like just like imagine yourself, if you were going out and doing a search for something and you wanted the answer, right, to a specific topic, you're going to go on Google and you're going to start typing something in. So I'm going to share my screen here just so you can kind of follow along just with the, an idea here. So like if I was on Google and I started like how to buy, see, I'm going to start getting a, uh, a bunch of suggestions, right? So here's how to buy a house. Okay. So maybe I see that and I'm going to say, okay, how to buy a house. Well, now you can see what the next Google suggestions are and exactly how people are typing them in. So that's going to give me an idea of now the basics of what I can start to do some additional keyword research for. So I see how to buy a house in Texas how to buy a house in San Antonio. Well, now the next thing you want to do is go to a keyword research tool, something that is actually built uh, to give you a little bit of extra insight around these keywords. I like to use KW Finder. I've actually got a link for it down below um, that if you want to go check it out, you can do that. They've got a free trial, but essentially you just type in that keyword into KW Finder and it's going to tell you, it's going to say, okay, that keyword brings in about 1500 searches every single month. And then it even gives you a keyword difficulty score. And so it tells you based on what it sees as far as the other, you can see right over here, the other top, um, posts on Google are right now. So here's the top 10 posts. If you were to search that term, 
uh, that are going to show up based on those. And it's done all the analysis of those different sites. It knows that you can crack into that top 10 pretty easily. There's some over here that don't have very strong profiles. And so a 17 is a still easy difficulty. Now, like for instance, over here, let's see here. If I clicked on that 53, 50 is hard, right? You're not going to want to go after a hard keyword term, um, especially if you're a new blog, uh, you know, a new blogger. So stick to things that are less than 30, in my opinion. So anything that has a keyword difficulty score of 30 and below is what you stick to. And then what's cool about this tool is you can actually click to favorite uh, these uh, terms and then you can create lists. So like, for instance, here's my list for San Antonio real estate. And I just have kind of like a target of, okay, I want to create these different blogs because I've identified that they, as they have a good amount of search traffic. Uh, I like anything, you know, above a hundred searches per month is great, but sometimes you'll get a few that are a little less than that. And if they are less than that, I like them to be at least things that I really like neighborhoods that are close to me or things that I really want to rank for, even if they're not that highly trafficked, but they also have to be easy to get, go after. So like a 12 is super simple. 30 is a little bit more difficult, but it's definitely still possible. So um, I've, I've ranked for ones that are 30 uh, before. So like best place to live in San Antonio. Now, here's the important thing to know about keywords is that you need to optimize for them to be pretty much spelled out just like that. Don't kind of change too far from those keywords. Now, when I say that, we also, uh, you know, you can get into something called keyword stuffing, where you're just stuffing that exact phrase into your blog post way too many times, just because then you think, uh, you know, Google will know that that is what your blog post about. Don't do it like that. But when I do say to stick to the keyword, stick to it in your headline. So if yours was best place to live in San Antonio, have that be in your headline verbatim, how to live in San Antonio, you know, my comprehensive guide right? Or something like that. But you'd want to keep that keyword together. Don't shuffle around the terms because if you move some of these words around, you can go from having, you know, a 30 difficulty to like a 50 difficulty, even though it's kind of the same concept, it might just be a different way that they've shifted those words. So be very intentional and very specific about how you're going after your headlines, after what the text is inside of your posts, uh, and all of that good stuff. So, um, that is one, one tip there. The other way that you can find some good keywords is actually with KW finder. They've got a tool in here where you can search by domain. So if there's any domains, any websites that are in your space, in your niche that you see coming up fairly often when you're doing your keyword research, like, uh, like, let's just say this was my term here, I can look and see which websites are kind of coming up here, San Antonio mag area vibes.com. And then if I click on another one, and if I start seeing ones that are coming up pretty often, like KW San Antonio is one that they're in a lot of these terms. Well, now I can do a domain search for kwsanantonio.com and I can see all of the different searches that they rank for. And so I can kind of come through here and I'll look at, let's just say the estimated visits that they're getting on their site. I'll start at the top. I sort it by estimated visits. I filter it so that way none of these terms have a higher keyword difficulty than 30. So you see that there. And now I can kind of look through here and see, okay, so there's, they're ranking for Alamo ranch as number one. Uh, and if I come in here and sometimes it's a little off, like this shows it as three, uh, it's always kind of going back and forth, but on average, they're pulling their data data from averages. So they've averaged that one spot for quite some time. Um, it might just bounce around a little bit, but I can see that's only a difficulty of 22. I could actually go after that term myself, gets 2,400 searches per month. They're getting 830 visits uh, from that term a month, estimated, might be off uh, a little bit. But then if you see here that uh, you can't see what it is, if you just click it, it'll then update it. So then of course they're ranking for their own name, Keller Williams Heritage, but then you're gonna get ideas like, okay, New Year's Eve, San Antonio. Maybe I wanna do an article about the best way to celebrate New Year's Eve in San Antonio. Well, now I can create that. I can see it actually creates a lot of traffic uh, and it's a 27, so it's definitely under 30. I can go for it. Now, one thing you'll note is that uh, you'll see uh, the trend that usually says like, 
this is only searched once per year, right? Uh, it only goes up at one point in time. Whereas like ones like this say, you know, these are trends over time. Like people are searching this constantly. And so anyways, Christmas Eve, you see the same thing with that. But anyways, that gives you some more ideas of ways that you can start creating blog posts and create them in a way that people are searching for them already. Uh, all right, so let's move back over to our slides here. The other one too is answerthepublic.com. You can check that one out. Basically put a keyword in there and it's going to spit out a whole bunch of keywords that are related to that keyword. And then you can uh, export that list. You can download it, copy all of the terms, and then just upload them onto KW Finder. There's a feature in KW Finder called import. In fact, I'll show it to you here. You just click on import right there. And uh, you can either drag your Excel spreadsheet right here or just copy and paste the keywords uh, right here and then say process keywords. And then it's going to analyze all of those keywords that you typed in. And then you can start kind of sifting through those and figuring out which ones are easy to go after, which ones, uh, how, how should you specify those terms properly to give you the best, um, not only search volume, but also the easiest difficulty. So that's another good little tip there. All right, and then search intent. This is another important one too, is you want to, once you've figured out, or at least you think you know what keywords you wanna go after, search it in Google and see what type of posts come up for it. Because just because it's an easy post or it gets a lot of traffic may not mean it's the right post for you to put as a blog post. So for instance, like let's just say that you wanted to rank for um, you know, best shoes and you do that search best shoes and then all that comes up are like e-commerce sites, sites that are selling bunch of shoes. Well, chances are your blog post isn't going to get shown up even if it is easy to go after because that's not the searcher's intent. Google has already established that if somebody searches best shoes, they typically want to actually just go straight to the page that is selling best shoes. If yours is just a blog post with like links to things, that's not going to be the right intent. And so you'll never rank for it. So when you establish what your keyword is going to be, then do an actual search for it and make sure that most of what is uh, being published on Google as far as the first page has some blog posts. If not, they're all blog posts. You know, uh, that that's just a good guide to kind of have you, you start there. So we talked about KW Finder. We talked about creating lists. Uh, and then we talked about covering your competitors best traffic. So again, uh, that's going to be all the things that you can start with for keywords. And that is where you need to start before you ever start writing your blog. In fact, I've spoken before about even just doing keyword research for YouTube. And what I say is I like to build my own content calendar, my own content spreadsheet, where I actually do all of the kind of keyword research for multiple terms up front. That way I'm not just, you know, having to do the same process week after week. I've already established the 50 keywords that I want to go after. And then each week, all I'm doing is picking one off the list. All right, I'm gonna do this one this week. I'm gonna do that one this week and that's it. And then I move on to the next one and I don't have to constantly be doing keyword research. I do it all up front create my lists every now and then, you know, if it's been a few months, I'll go in and update just because, you know, search difficulties and things like that do change over time. And so you want to make sure that, you know, nothing's bumped up a, a ton in the last little while since you originally created that list. But for the most part, it kind of stays consistent. So if you create that content list, it'll help keep you focused to where all you're going to do at that point, you know, once you've come up with all your keywords is just start producing the content. Uh, around those. All right, now here's the part of the video where I ask you, please hit that subscribe button. If you're not already subscribed to this channel, I come out with a new real estate training video like this every single week. Give the video a like if you're getting some value out of it and leave me a comment. Let me know what you think. If you got any other questions or maybe uh, if you have some different uh, suggestions with regards to blogging. All right, but let's go ahead and move on. Sticking with the technical aspects. Next, we're gonna talk about on-page SEO. So SEO stands for search engine optimization. Again, why spend all the effort creating great blog posts if you're not gonna optimize them so that the th search engines pick them up and you can actually get traffic to those blog posts. So uh, on-page SEO, what that refers to is actually optimizing the individual posts in order to rank higher and earn more traffic. So what you can actually do within your post to get more traffic onto them. So first off, keywords. Again, we talked all about them, how important they are. Make sure that those keywords show up in the key places. So of course, that's your title, uh, and again, Try and make it verbatim. 
put them even close to the beginning of your title versus putting it at the end of the title. Uh, and then also H1, H2, all that means is your primary headers. Uh, so typically your title and your H1 tag are the same within your blog, uh, but just make sure some themes might be different. Uh, some websites may be different. So just make sure though that your title and your H1 tags uh, both have the keywords in them. And then somewhere in the post, H2 just means it's like a subheading. Uh, use your keyword in a subheading as well. Don't just make it the same thing as your H1 or that your title tag, but somehow weave a different extra few words into it or something, but use them in a subheading. And then in the first hundred words of your post, make sure that your keywords are in there as well. Uh, your meta description. So this is where there should be a spot somewhere on your theme editor, or if you're using WordPress, you'll see it at the bottom. If you're using like Yoast, which is an SEO plugin uh, that you can install there is a spot where you can actually manually type in what you want your meta description to be. And your meta description is basically on Google. If somebody's search is that search term, um, you know, they're going to see the title. They're going to typically see the breadcrumbs saying like, here's, you know, the homepage, then it goes to this page, then it goes to that, you know, actual landing page. And then they're going to see the meta description, which is like a little description at the bottom saying what the page is about. If you don't manually fill this out, Google will take what they think is the best from the article which may not be your uh, ideal meta description. So definitely type in a meta description manually for each of your posts and make sure that your keyword shows up somewhere in that meta description. I typically like to stay with this format where I just say, this is a, and then you type a, you know, whatever your topic is, you know, uh, blog post about blogging for real estate, learn how to write better blogs from this ultimate guide on blogging for real estate, right? Like that's typically the format. You kind of spruce it up a little bit, but just something like that because you don't have a whole lot of characters to use. Uh, what's really important too, and this is where it kind of gets into your um, not having clickbaity kind of titles is Google picks up on all this stuff. And so if somebody clicks over to your, your, your page, but then they bounce right off of it, if it's just like a crummy site or it's not really good uh, information and they just bounce right off of it, they don't spend any dwell time on the page. Google has all of those as far as ranking factors. So make sure again, if you're going to spend time creating blog posts, make sure that they're helpful, make sure that they're easy to digest. People like to kind of scroll through them. There's pictures that take up a little bit more time um, for them to go through and for them to observe all of that. All that stuff does help um, your page loading speed. Here's the one thing I will say is a caveat to like too many images or too much multimedia, too many fancy things on your blog. Keep it simple because I promise you, you know, I went down that rabbit hole before where you download so many plugins to make, you know, this cool feature on your site and this cool feature on your site. But the more plugins and the more things that you try and do with your website, typically all of those features takes time to load. And we might be talking about milliseconds, but it doesn't matter. You want your page to load on average in one and a half seconds or less. And so, you know, adding a ton of big images and not optimizing those images properly, using the right size, using the right uh, type of uh, file. So for instance, there's JPEGs and then there's PNG files. JPEGs are typically less file size. They might not be as good a quality, uh, but as a, as a PNG, but they're still very good quality. And then you might even want to compress them further. There's uh, different plugins you can install that don't really run on your site. They just help you uh, optimize your images. So they're not going to really slow down your page any. In fact, they'll help speed up your page because they're going to optimize and compress those images. Um, and so you might want to consider getting some, something like that if you are going to be using a lot of images, which I would suggest that you do at least four or five images per post just to give it a little bit of extra uh, pop. And if you can create unique images where you've actually captured the image and it or it's an infographic or something even better. Uh, but if not, you know, using stock imagery is going to be better than nothing and just having a long block of text. Uh, so anyways, uh, that I kind of got off on a tangent, but it is important as far as making sure that your page does load quickly. So you always want to be using a tool like Google page speed, which will help kind of show you if there's, uh, opportunities for you to capitalize. If there's too many things you're trying to do, there's a few other tools that I'll use that are similar to Google page speed. GTmetrics.com is one. 
and so is Pingdom, P-I-N-G-D-O-M. If you just do that, uh, a Google search for it, it will show up. Uh, and you can kind of see how big is your page, uh, how fast does it load. Usually you want your pages to be under two megabytes in size. So again, if you are putting a ton of big pictures on there, it's going to be over two megabytes. It's going to take a ton of time to load. And then Google will actually not uh, suggest your article just because it might take users too long for their page to load. Now, typically, once you get up into that second and a half, you know, under two second loading speed, you're not going to get a whole lot of boost by like incrementally getting it to 1.3 seconds or anything. So like once you get it fast enough, that's good. Move on. Don't keep getting, there's some people about blogging. They just go crazy and they have to, you know, try and get faster and faster thinking it's going to make, move the needle. But there's been studies that as long as it's decently quick, you're not going to get much more boost than that, but you will get penalized severely if it takes like five seconds to load or seven seconds to load a page. Uh, so anyways, moving on, we're going to go to click through rate. So again, this is where you want good title, good meta description, um, and then even a good featured image. Cause sometimes, especially on like mobile results, it will show up your featured image. So make sure that the featured image, it usually shows as square. So if you are using uh, landscape kind of like rectangular featured images, make sure how it's going to look on as a square when it crops it. And so I had actually made this mistake on a lot of my featured images and they still are like this today where you know I'd have text in them but it would be getting cut off because it was only cropping the center. So it's not really a good appearance. It may uh, lead somebody not to click on it. And so anyways, Yoast, when you look at that plugin, it should show you an example of what it will look like on the search engine page so that uh, if you are using a featured image that might not be ideal, you can change that out. Uh, internal links. So again, these are all things that are going to go into the actual post, each and every post. Uh, internal links. These are where you link to other pages on your website. So for instance, if I do a post about, you know, blogging for real estate, but then I reference in that article, YouTube for real estate, and I want to link to my post, YouTube for real estate that I have on my site, then I can do that through an internal link. And those are so important. It helps kind of spread your, your, your link credibility throughout your site all around the different posts. And so not only is it helpful to your audience, to the person reading the article to give them additional information, uh, but it's also going to let Google know that, hey, you know, there's other sites that are just as powerful and it helps you rank uh, as far as, you know, getting uh, your search uh, engine results higher than if you didn't have internal links suggesting that page on your site. And so you can control your internal links. There's links that we're going to talk about next called backlinks where you have to have other people link to your stuff, which is a little bit harder, but at least for internal links, since you're in control there, you should optimize those and make sure that you're spreading links around within your site as much as you possibly can. And there's a plugin that you can download called Link Whisperer that makes it very easy to do that. Literally, you can search your entire site uh, for any particular keyword and it'll find all of the articles that references that keyword. And then you can easily just link up, uh, create internal links to that page. And so that way, you know, if you have a page about blogging for real estate, if you've done any other posts, say you've got a hundred posts on your, your blog site, it's going to find all of the other ones that reference blogging for real estate. And maybe you hadn't done an internal link before. Um, it'll now give you the opportunity where you can just choose in bulk to link all of those to that new article that you created or that new post you created. And then external links, make sure too, this gives your post credibility that you're linking to external sources outside of your web page. Um, this is helpful too, especially if they're credible sources. Don't just link to bad websites, but if you link to a good website, it actually helps your credibility out with Google as well. All right, so now we're gonna talk about off-page SEO. So these are all the things that you do outside of creating the post that you want to do to get your post more credibility and yeah, get, it, get it noticed a little bit better. So for instance, taking action, action outside of your website to rank higher, uh, rank post higher and earn more traffic. So you can do things like sharing your post on social media and then asking other people to share it as well. Uh, that is a ranking signal for Google. They can track how many shares a particular article gets. The more Facebook shares, Twitter shares, Pinterest shares, all those types of things, the more credible your article will be and it will help increase the rankings on the Google search results. Uh, also, uh, and I kind of uh, went out of order here, but backlink building, I'll talk about that next. This is where you can actually do outreach to other uh, related sites in your niche and ask for backlinks to articles that you might think 
help their audience and maybe they don't already have that type of context on their page or that type of that type of article on their page. And so that's one way to do it. Also broken links. So for instance, a lot of times people create websites and maybe they don't update them every single time or it's a post that you made a year ago and then what ends up happening is somebody will change the URL or their site will come down and then that becomes a broken link because the link is still out there sending people to those pages but when they go there, it gives them an error and it says this page doesn't exist anymore. Well, you can actually do searches for websites that have broken links in them and it, of course related to what your content is about. And then once you've found those broken links, you can reach out to those owners and actually say, hey, I just noticed you had a broken link on this page. I actually just created an article that, you know, meets the same needs or, you know, it basically uh, relates to what you were speaking about or linking to. Um, would you, you know, be open to, to linking my article since that one is no longer there anymore, right? And some will, some won't. But you have the habit of doing that over time. And there's tools, and I'll show you here, uh, that you can use to help you do that. So for instance, uh, even on KW Finder, right? Uh, here's one where, uh, I, let's just say I was gonna search for blogging for real estate. I have the search term here. Now I can see all of the different uh, places where uh, blogging for real estate comes up, right? And so with this, I can actually see that uh, all, these are how many links, backlinks, that the different articles have on them. So like for instance, this one has six backlinks. What I could do is I click these three dots here and I say show backlinks and there we go. It's going to take me to this tool right here where I can now see all of the different other sites that linked to that person's article. And so if they're willing to link to that person's article, there might be a chance that they're willing to link to my article, right? And so what you can then do is go to these sites, find out who runs them, get their email address, usually it's on their page, and email them and ask them, say, hey, I just did an article about this. I noticed that you linked uh, to this page. You know, would you be open to linking to mine, right? So you're just basically asking. It's kind of a numbers game. Not everybody is going to do it, but you don't need a whole ton of backlinks. Uh, a few will do the trick. And so, you know, you can see here that here's a few different pages there. Here was a, a like, if you looked here, you can see here, like this one was the, uh, the market business news. So if I look here, that was this one right here, Market Business News. If you click on that, it opens up the actual page and then you can scroll and you can see where they linked to that person's post. Because if you look in the bottom left, it says that life marketing there. So that's where they linked to their page, right? Here's another one, Netfluence. This is where they linked to the other person's page, life marketing. They used capture more leads. Right. So that I don't know how that I guess here says regular blogging right there. So you could actually reach out and say, hey, would you mind switching out? Especially like if you notice on this one, I've got a tool up here uh, called Link Results. Right. You can actually get this. It's a Google Chrome extension and there's one invalid links and it happens to be the one that they're linking to that blogging site. So if I click on that, you'll notice here it actually doesn't even work. So there's a broken link. I just found it. Uh, kind of going through the person's page. So now I could actually reach out, if I go back to this page here, reach out to the owner of this site and say, hey, you know, not sure if you're still updating your page or not, um, but if you are, I just had come across this post of yours, very well written, um, you know, give them a little compliment and say, by the way, though, one of the links didn't work, just so happens that, you know, th I have a, I've got a post that speaks to this perfectly, would you mind swapping it out, right? You're helping them out, they're helping you out, it kind of works to both of our favor. There's also a uh, broken link check where you can uh, just type in any website here and it's going to go through their entire website and find broken links. So if there's somebody that's in your niche that uh, speaks to it, or maybe it's just a, a website that a lot of people go to that's in your area for real estate, go there and see if they've got any broken links. And if you have any posts that speak to any of their broken links, well, now you might have an opportunity to get some backlinks on your website, which are very, very powerful. All right. So that being said, let's go ahead and click back over here. 
talked about backlinks. And then the, the last one that I wanted to end on is uh, for off-page SEO is building an email list from day one. I wished that I had started building my email list from day one, but I didn't. I waited about a year. Uh, who knows? I don't know how many extra emails I'd have, but either way, it's just good practice to have something. Uh, even if you just, your only offer is, hey, subscribe to my email list so I can email whenever I have a new post. That is at least more effective than nothing. Uh, and eventually you'll see a lot of times when people have blogs, they'll offer like a free guide or a free, you know, mini course or something like that for somebody to sign up with their email. And maybe eventually you'll want to get to that point because that's a better giveaway. So people will be more enticed to sign up for it than just getting on your email list. But even if you just are starting out and you say, hey, you know, join my email list, type in your email here, and you start collecting emails from day one, that's going to be so important. I'll never forget now, now you know, whenever I release a new blog post um, and I put it online, within about, you know, the first, you know, hour or so that I blast it out to my email list and I put it on Facebook, uh, I usually end up getting two to 300 people that are reading that post, which again, in Google's eyes, when they see all sorts of, you know, traffic going to something, they're going to say, Hey, what's going on here? Let me, you know, go check it out. Um, and potentially rank your, your post a lot faster than if you didn't do any kind of outreach. If you didn't have an email list, if you didn't do anything on social and it was just out there. It's going to take a while to get traffic to it. And so Google may not want to promote it or push it up in the search rankings until they have more of a defined um, this is what people like, you know what I mean? Cause like if they go to my page and some people are reading it for four or five, six minutes, they can see the average time on page is five, six minutes. They know it's a good post. Um, if you know, you don't have any traffic except for what might come uh, over time through search. And if those people get on it and they leave after a couple seconds, they may never show that post of yours. So again, build an email list from day one and then start promoting your posts whenever you have new blog posts to that email list. All right, we're going to get into some real estate specific tips now uh, as far as uh, how this can apply to you as a real estate agent. So hopefully this is helpful. But one of the things that, uh, and I'll share with you kind of some of the different keywords that I'm targeting as a real estate agent, but uh, zip codes and neighborhoods are fantastic uh, things to blog about. Again, because you'll see there is a lot of search traffic with regards to neighborhoods and zip codes. Um, you can add IDX links to your blog posts. And then that kind of goes hand in hand with this next tip, which is only create content on your own owned domain. So again, if you're using like a CRM or a website provider, uh, like for instance, I use KV Core for my buyers and sellers to go look uh, at real estate, I don't want to put my blog on that page because that means that I'm literally then married into KV Core for as long as I want to have uh, my blog and my real estate business going for. And so I may want to switch, right? And so in that case, I've got my own blog. And then whenever I do a post, if it mentions real estate or like, hey, these are the top 10 homes in the zip code, I can then add in a link that sends somebody over to my IDX website. Um, and instead of doing it backwards and just putting my blog posts on that IDX website. So, you know, the one thing about that is then if you're doing that, you can go back if you switch your CRM or something down the road and swap out those links to your new CRM and the actual original ranking blog post still stays on your own owned domain. And so you won't lose any of your traffic. Whereas if you switched with the alternative, you would lose all of those great content, all of those blog posts that you had created. Even if you copied and pasted them to a different website at that point in time, the URL changes, everything changes. You're going to lose anything that you had built up. All right. Uh, the different types of posts that you uh, can make or that uh, I've made before are real estate market info is always good. You want to find out uh, the, the keywords, though, that people are searching for. Uh, so that way you're not just creating, if you just say the July San Antonio market report, nobody's really searching that. Like who goes on to Google and searches July San Antonio market report, right? And so you got to find out what are people actually searching for? What's the buzzwords uh, that people are searching? And you can use KW Finder for that. Uh, lifestyle in your market. So this kind of is like uh, the the Christmas, uh, you know, in San Antonio, the best coffee shops in San Antonio, right? Like those types of things are lifestyle. And then how to buy and how to sell posts. These may not be specific to your market, but they are actually very helpful, especially even if it's, you know, a nationwide audience, 
If you're getting more traffic on your blog post, even if it's from people that may not be in your market to buy a home from you, it is still good for your blog because you're getting more traffic on your site. Uh, it's going to rank all of your posts on all of your uh, on your site higher just because you're getting traffic from the nationwide audience. So let me kind of show you uh, what I mean by that when I talk about the different posts that I have. I'm gonna share my screen here. So there you go. So here's kind of like some targets uh, that I'm looking at. You know, homes for sale in 78222. It's 190 searches per month, 28 difficulty. I could easily go after that one uh, and start to rank for it. So pick out zip codes that you like. Pick out areas like Castle Hills. That's a city within San Antonio that is a city that I like to market to. And I can do that. 200 searches per month. Be the most helpful person uh, if somebody was looking for a house in Castle Hills. Average prices, you know, top listings, what the schools are, what the shopping is. Like if you do one of those every single week for a different city or a different uh, zip code in your market, you'll see over the course of a year, you'll have 50 posts out there with all of the top neighborhoods that you want to work, all the top zip codes that you want to work. Uh, and you're going to start getting leads from those people because you've been so helpful, uh, it, you know, giving them all of the information that they need. All right. So that being said, we're going to wrap it up here. I've got a few last other tips that we're going to talk about. So original images are better, like I said, than stock images. So if you've got any original images uh, of whatever it is that you're talking about, right? If you're talking about a neighborhood, uh, if you got pictures of that neighborhood or even better video of that neighborhood or of the schools in the area or anything like that, all of those things are going to be a lot more impactful and useful than just a picture of a school or the picture of houses in a neighborhood, right? Like if you've got those unique images, that's going to be really helpful. If you do need stock images though, sometimes, you know, we can't have all the images all the time. Uh, I like to use Pixabay or Unsplash for stock images. Keep it simple. I had mentioned this earlier, page speed matters. Uh, so check out Google page speed, check out GT metrics. One and a half seconds should be your, your go-to for load time under two megabytes uh, as far as your full page file size. Make sure you've set up Google Analytics. Again, I kind of talk about this with YouTube. Don't focus too much on the analytics in the beginning. You got to have some good amount of traffic going through to really where those analytics start really meaning anything, but set it up so that way, you know, eventually you can start to kind of analyze things. And you can also set up your Google Search Console, which is great as well, because that's going to give you all of the different keywords that you're actually starting to rank for. Um, you can see all sorts of data with regards to Google search um, and how your website is doing with regards to Google search. Google analytics is more like once they've hit your page, what are they doing, right? Like how long are they spending on your, your, your page? Which site, which different uh, pages are they going to? Whereas Google search console tells you like, this was what somebody typed in. And when they did that, they went to this page. It'll also say like your, you know, post was, um, shown to people a thousand times and they clicked on it, you know, 40 of those times or something like that. So you can start to see what your click through rates are. And then of course, set up a Facebook pixel, uh, as well. So that way, even if in the beginning, you're not going to do any retargeting or anything like that to your audience, you eventually can do the retargeting and all of the data was already there. All of that stuff is very, very uh, simple to do as far as installing code. If you've built your own website, I assume you probably know how to do that yourself. If you didn't build your website, then get to the person who did and they can definitely install those codes for you. It literally just takes a few minutes. And so, all right, well, I hope that was helpful guys. Again, if you haven't already, make sure that you're subscribed to this channel. I come out with another one of these videos next week and every single week after that. Uh, give this video a like. I really appreciate, especially if you got to this point in the video, the very far end, uh, you are part of the 1% crew. Leave a comment. Let me know what you liked, what some of the com or some of the uh, best information that you received out of this were. And, uh, and then also if you made it to the 1%, leave me and let me know that you're part of that 1% crew. And, uh, if there's any other questions that you have, put them in the comments below, but otherwise I'll see you guys next week. Bye.